Okay, so here's a quick story about November 713. We got stranded on Block Island on September 19th into the 20th. And the issue was that when we were departing, uh, when we did the engine startup, fuel pump two would not engage and the LED light for fuel pump number two would not illuminate. So right away, knowing the schematics sort of in my mind, um, that to me sounded like it was a switch problem, not necessarily a fuel pump problem. So I did a little investigating now that we're back at the hangar. And here's sort of what I found. Here's the ES6000, well, I was gonna say 6009, it's not, 60009. This is the HIC connector module, which is behind the co-pilot screen mounted uh, on the bottom of the instrument panel there. So the issue was this connector right here. And inside this connector, you'll see lines for fuel pump one, fuel pump two, goes out to the two switches. Now the issue that I experienced is that this connector here, although it snapped in place, uh, it, it's sort of loose. And um, this might be a van's design thing that they might need to look at because as far as Rotax goes, their system over here on this side is kind of redundant. Both of these connectors, connector A and B, would need to pop out to disengage both of the fuel pumps. You see here on the A connector, you have fuel pump one and the ground for it. And down here you have fuel pump two and the ground for that one. Um, the likelihood of both of these popping out at the same time, probably not likely. Um, chances of this popping out on its own, again, if it's latched in place, not likely. But uh, as we'll see here, I can demonstrate what's going on. Uh, so right now we have, and of course you don't hear the fuel pump running right now. There's nothing running. But down here we have fuel pump number one engaged. So if I go back here and here's the connector that we're talking about, this rectangular one with eight pins. If we move this slightly, hopefully you can hear that fuel pump. Let's see. Oh, there we go. That's it. And now back there, you can hear that pump running. If I let go, it still runs. But if I tap it a little bit, oh, there we go. Now the fuel pump stopped, although that light is still engaged. So there's some uh, issue, and, and I think right now, when that light is engaged but it's not running, that means that the ground wire is connected from here all the way down to here, which makes that light illuminate, um, but the positive pin is not connected. Uh, and sometimes if you jiggle it a little bit differently, sometimes you can get the light to go out um, and also the pump to go out at the same time. So I'm not sure if the problem is my connector or the PCB board. Uh, I think I'm gonna just order a new PCB board. That seems like the, the quickest thing to replace. Uh, it's just, just held in place by four screws. Um, but I think maybe Vans should take a look at separating this connector into two different connectors just for redundancy and to extend the redundancy that, that Rotex had built into their design. Four to six days later. So by the time I publish this video, Service Bulletin 41 should be out. Vans was nice enough to provide me with a, a draft of it. Uh, they didn't have all the parts in stock yet, namely the electrical connector. But we're going to film this video according to the draft. Um, and we'll see what we come up with at the end of this. So to make this connector, we need a couple of things. We need some Tefcel wire, number 12 gauge, number... 14 gauge. We need four lengths of four inches each. We need a back shell. And all of these part numbers from Molex will be in the description below. We need some pins. We need four pins for number 12 gauge and four pins for number 14 gauge. The Vans diagram to make this connector specifies certain uh, Molex part numbers. And there is some confusion because they make these same exact pins with gold plating or with tin plating, and they're calling for the gold plating pins. That's not real gold. Hell no. Looks pretty good. Yeah. Looks like real gold. It's, it's some good fake it's shit. Some good fake shit. <laughs> However, when I looked at the HIC connector, it doesn't look like they use the gold, uh, the gold pins in that connector. 
although it is difficult to see inside the connector because of the plastic housing. Um, but this is what they call for in their, in their plans, is the gold plated pins. We need these TPA little plastic inserts, and I'll show you what they do in a minute. And then we need this, the F12334. And according to this, this is all that we need for the service bulletin. Uh, right now they list this as during next inspection, but to be honest, I, I, would, I would just ground the airplane and do it as soon as possible. Um, so I'm gonna go through how to make a pin and insert a pin into this connector. Oh yes, and you need the connector itself too. So I have two more wires to put into this connector. Um, I've taken one of my lengths of 14 gauge wire. I've stripped off the end of it, as you can see here. Now you wanna strip off just enough so that it passes past this prong here, um, but doesn't really extend in, you know, any, any further than that. And this prong here, you're gonna bend this. This is gonna kind of bear hug around the insulation. So you only need, oh, I don't know what that is, maybe a, a eighth of an inch, maybe a, a quarter of an inch or so. Um, you can eyeball this, how much you have to uh, pare back that insulation. Then we're going to get our crimpers. You should have a pair of these from when you built the plane. Now, when you're going to crimp this, the smaller the connector, uh, well, the connector size determines which one of these crimp positions you're gonna use. B is the biggest, followed by A, C, D, and then E is the smallest. So for this 12 gauge wire, I might use C. For the uh, 14 gauge wire, I might use C. For the 12 gauge wire, I might use A or B. Uh, so we're gonna use C on this one and see how that turns out. So we've crimped this with C. And you can see how, how that kind of wrapped around there very, very snugly. Now there's a little piece of wire that extends beyond that crimp, uh, which is not sort of compressed in the crimp. And that sort of helps to hold the wire in place so it doesn't pull out. So it's important that the wire extends a little bit beyond that crimp. So now we're going to wrap these, um, these tongs here around the insulation. So as you can see here, those tongs are now wrapped around the insulation. Now, mind you, it makes a difference which way you put it into this crimper. You see on the main crimp, so you put that into focus, um, you see how the two sides sort of like wrap around and uh, sort of point down in the center of the crimp there. That's because this was inserted this way into the, into the crimper. Uh, now to wrap those tongs around the back, around the insulation, um, you can do it a couple different ways. I like to kind of put the wire in it kind of upside down. Uh, so it sort of tends to wrap that around and not actually um, put the ends of those tongs down into the center of the conductor. Now it does make a difference which way you insert this connector into the Molex connector. If you see through the connector here, you see a little locking tab on one side. The, the top side of those holes. So that locking tab is going to lock with the top of this. This side, right? Right here. It's not the, not the crimped side, it's gonna be this side. So when you insert it, the locking tab is gonna go right into that, that hole on the top surface that you see here. So for these TPA clips, it actually is possible to put them in the wrong way on these connectors. So I should show you here exactly what it's supposed to do. The prongs of these plastic clips are going to be inserted so that they press up against that little metal tab of the metal connector. That's what holds it in place and holds that pin down. And that is the advantage of Megafit. Now the wires will still jiggle around inside the connector Sort of like Bill Cosby's Jello Jigglers. Jigglers! Jiggle, 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 boom, jiggle. But the TPAs are there only to prevent them from backing out. Sort of like his pills. Good! Now I've put both halves of the clamshell on. Both halves are symmetrical, it's the same part number. 
and I used a uh, pretty hefty zip tie here to tie that in place. Now we're going to modify the F12334 and turn it in from this into that. It looks like I have about four and a half inches from this point all the way to the tip of the wire. And the electrical diagram here called for four inches. And this is just the, the pigtail. Uh, hopefully Vans will have this supplied to you pre-made. But of course, because I'm doing this earlier before the service bulletin has been announced, I have to make my own. So I'll be the first to admit that I hate doing extra work. Now, you can get to those wires in there to put the butt splices on them. Oop, there's my butt. But I'm just going ahead and removing all of these screws. I'm just gonna take this panel off. I found that screw gun, awesome. Also for this one screw right here, I have a longer bit to get to that guy right there. That works out pretty good. And then to get to, you can barely see it. That guy all the way in there, you have to close the canopy. So perhaps the first thing that you should be doing is closing the canopy and taking that one screw out. I did notice that some newer canopies have not, um, this cutout isn't in the canopy yet. So you might have difficulty getting to that screw um, without this cutout. Alternatively, you can just take the canopy all the way off. Uh, we have the module installed here. One of the issues that uh, I think I came across was that the existing screws that you use to fasten that module to the bottom of the instrument panel, I don't think the screws were long enough, the ones that go through the front here and here with that extra piece of metal. So what I ended up doing was I took a number six screw and I just kind of, these are uh, 832R uh, eights. If you have R6s, that's probably the size that you need. I didn't have them. I had to grind down a screw um, just a little bit uh, to, to get that in there. The, so I put the module in first. I went ahead and connected all of the, the D-sub connectors and the HIC connectors. And then I used, uh, now the instructions call for butt connectors. Butt scratcher, butt scratcher. Get your butt scratcher here. Butt scratcher. 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 Uh, I didn't have them. Oh, I had them, but I didn't have the heat shrink type. And I feel a little bit more comfortable using the solder sleeves instead. Uh, I use these all the time uh, at work and stuff. So this isn't a, uh, a big deal to me. If you're new to solder sleeves, um, maybe you don't want to, you, you know, don't make this be your first project. Uh, these wires here are pretty critical um, when it comes to your fuel pumps. Uh, so I think I'm gonna secure these with a zip tie, a couple of zip ties. And here's what we ended up with. So as you can see back here, I have one wide zip tie on the clamshell. I have a thinner zip tie here securing the wires to this bracket. Now remember, I rounded off the edge of this bracket, so there's no sharp edges. However, I'm gonna put down some mouse tracks uh, on this edge here just to, just to help out and make sure that nothing ever rubs uh, through the insulation on these wires here. And even if I did use the heat shrink on this whole bundle, I probably still would use the mouse tracks here too. One minute, 37 seconds later. So I did not have any mouse tracks left. So what I did was I took a little section, probably about an inch and a half, of this hard tubing, which I believe we used on the pitot line. I filled it with red RTV and I cut a slit down the center and I'm just going to put it on that top edge right there. Okay, so I'm going to clean this up a little bit, but I use about one inch, same concept. You fill the tube up with RTV and I just slid it down along that edge. And this guy here, I moved over a little bit, a little bit too long. Um, after this cures up, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna cut that, and because uh, otherwise maybe this cable will bump into it. Something will bump into it and knock this off. So that about sums up the service bulletin. Again, I would absolutely do this at your earliest convenience. Um, I definitely would not wait a whole year until your next annual. 
But if your annual is coming up within a month or two, sure, you know, wait till then. Uh, the real issue is that you have no idea that your fuel pump failed in flight uh, unless you happen to look down and see that the PSI is uh, one, one and a half points lower than it normally is. Uh, so you could be having problems and not, not realize it. Of course, if you're logging your data to Garmin Pilot uh, or one of those services that records from your EFIS, you can look back and uh, take a look at your fuel PSI historically, which is what I did. Uh, and it seems as if I only had this problem, real problem in one of my flights that it failed for half an hour and I'll throw up the, the graphs here for you to look at. So this video was brought to you today by AirTrax. AirTrax is a system that I wrote during COVID basically because I was home, didn't feel like going out of the house. But I was also wondering what was happening at the airport that I was missing. So AirTrax is a system that you install at your local airport, connect a couple cameras to it, a couple antennas, and it will stream to YouTube exactly what's happening at your airport. You get to see, you get to hear, you get a almost like a flight tracker, you know, flight aware type of a map. You get to see all of the aircraft locally, what they're doing. Even on the ground, you can see where they're taxiing, which alleyways that they're pulling into. Are they stopping at the flight school or are they stopping for get, for, to get gas? And of course, airport managers love it as well because they get to do a report at the end of the day and see how much activity their air, airports actually had. I know a lot of the reporting to the FAA is just kind of estimates. Oh, you know, this airport had uh, 20 operations, you know, during uh, this week and they extrapolate. And, but this system will get your real numbers on how active your airport is. So maybe beneficial for local reporting. Um, and of course, some airports charge landing fees too. And I've known quite a few pilots to skirt the landing fees by landing after the airport manager leaves. Huh. Uh, so um, it's a system to uh, maybe help out with some revenue as well at your local airport. So take a look at the Old Bridge Airport YouTube feed. If you see any use for it, let me know. Or if you have any feature requests, I've been constantly tweaking it and adding some new things to it over time as, as time permits.